by which cloture was not invoked on S3414, the Cybersecurity Act of 2012, be agreed to, the motion to proceed be agreed to, and that there be up to 60 minutes of debate equally divided between the two leaders or their designees. Madam President. The Senator from Connecticut is recognized. Madam President, uh, I thank the Chair and uh, I want to begin by thanking the Majority Leader, Senator Reid, for being as steadfast as he has been in pursuit of a law that will protect America from what I think most security experts would say today, surprisingly, is the most serious threat to our security and to our economy, which is from cyber attack and cyber theft. And uh, the Majority Leader, uh, with the authority that he has uh, over our schedule, uh, has now um, called up the Cybersecurity Act of 2012, S3414, uh, for reconsideration. That is to say, to reconsider the cloture vote uh, that was held uh, in August and failed to get 60 votes, much to my uh, disappointment. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, Senator Reid now gives the Senate a second chance to do something to protect the American people from cyber attack uh, and cyber theft. And Madam President, if you just look at what's happened since the cloture vote on the Cybersecurity Act failed back in August, I think you will see how urgently we need to seize this opportunity, at least vote uh, uh, to proceed to the Cybersecurity Act. Senator Reid has made clear that uh, he would allow a finite number of amendments, a finite because uh, after all we're in a, a post-election so-called lame duck session, uh, the amendments uh, can't go on uh, forever, but a finite list uh, would allow there to be discussion and to vote on the major concerns that people still seem to have with the compromised bipartisan Cybersecurity Act of, uh, of 2012. And I, I will appeal to my colleagues in this statement, um, don't uh, be recorded as no. Uh, say yes to at least allowing a discussion uh, of cybersecurity legislation here offer some amendments, and then of course understand that uh, this, this doesn't, we're not a unicameral legislature to say the obvious. Uh, if, as I hope, we can pass cybersecurity legislation here, it has to go to conference with the House that uh, I would say has, a, uh, describing it uh, diplomatically, a, a different position than as reflected in the Cybersecurity Act of 2012 that uh, emerged in part from the Homeland Security uh, Committee, which is why I I'm, I'm have the honor of managing this uh, debate, uh, brought out uh, uh, with the strong support from my ranking member and dear friend, Senator Collins of Maine, and then uh, working together uh, with Senator Feinstein, the chair of the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator Rockefeller, the chair of the Commerce Committee, and Senator Carper, uh, who has had a real interest in cybersecurity uh, and as a leader uh, on the Homeland Security Committee, we bring this legislation forward. We're being given a second chance to raise our defenses against the rival nations, enemy nations, industrial spies, uh, cyber terrorists, organized anti-American non-state actors, and organized criminal gangs, international organized crime gangs, who are constantly probing our computer networks for weaknesses that they can um, exploit to steal industrial secrets, uh, to, uh, to take some of the best results of American innovation and entrepreneurship, take it overseas, <clears throat> and with it the jobs that, that come uh, with those secrets. Um, and of course to sabotage critical infrastructure, power plants, financial systems, telecommunication systems, water uh, systems, and so on and so on, which are the, the, the systems that we depend on in our society for our quality of life, for our freedom of expression. Uh, so many of them owned by the private sector, 
and managed and controlled now, operated by cyber systems over the Internet, and therefore subject to cyber attack. So that's what this bill is about. The bill is about creating standards for public-private cooperation to raise our defenses against cyber attack and cyber theft. Um, everybody you talk to in the public or private sector says today that we are vulnerable to attack. And this bill only relates to the, the most critical cyber infrastructure whose, uh, whose compromise, whose, whose uh, attack, whose, whose disabling would result in uh, mass casualties, catastrophic economic loss, and assaults on our uh, national security. So let me come back to what I said. You know, the best arguments for this bill and for adopting it today, uh, that is, the voting on the motion uh, to proceed and going to the bill, are uh, not the arguments, frankly, that I'll make on behalf of the bill, but the facts that have occurred in the limited amount of time since August when this initial vote to proceed to the Cybersecurity Act occurred. On August 15th, just two weeks after the last cloture vote, a computer virus called Shamoon erased the hard drives of 30,000 computers owned and operated by Saudi Aramco, one of the world's largest energy companies. And what happened as a result? Uh, as a result of the erasing of those hard drives, uh, there was replaced, the data files that were there, the data files were replaced with images of burning American flags. Pretty clear uh, who, the, who carried out this attack. The computers were ren rendered useless and had to be uh, replaced and restored. Uh, some uh, cyber experts that I trust say this was the most destructive cyber attack against a private company in history. A similar attack was carried out <clears throat> on the Qatari natural gas company called Rosgas and Iran. Remember the burning American flags. Iran is suspected as the attacker in both instances. Well, thanks to quick work, really extraordinary work by Aramco, and many of the world's leading cybersecurity uh, technologists and, and experts, the damage to Saudi Aramco was contained. But this attack could have thrown global oil markets into chaos in a lot of economies, uh, including ours, into greater stress than uh, we're already in. If orders couldn't be filled, our shipments uh, made. That was uh, August, two weeks after the last uh, cloture vote on the cybersecurity bill. Then uh, in September, the consumer web banking sites of some great American financial institutions, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, uh, PNC Bank, and some others came under the largest sustained denial of service attack in history. This is, I'm sure most of my colleagues know, is when the websites are, are essentially uh, overloaded, they're flooded, uh, to make it impossible uh, for them to stay up and provide the service they normally do. These attacks went on in different waves for weeks, knocking many of, of these uh, sites that are very important to uh, commercial life in our country offline or uh, slowing them to a crawl. Just take a look at how much commerce uh, is now conducted over the Internet, and I think you can see the, the potential uh, catastrophe here. These kinds of attacks really could bring our banking system uh, and the economy uh, to, to its knees. And again, uh, some uh, intelligence officials that I respect suspect that Iran or its agents uh, launched these attacks against the American banks. Defense Secretary Panetta warned in a recent speech that these and other cyber attacks show that we are approaching 
a cyber Pearl Harbor where, and I quote, an aggressor nation or extremist group could use these kinds of cyber tools to gain control of critical switches. They could derail passenger trains or even uh, more dangerous, derail passenger trains loaded with lethal chemicals. They could contaminate the water supply in major cities or shut down the power grid across large parts of the country, end quote. That's not science fiction. Um, that, that's not an alarmist. That's the Secretary of Defense of the United States, Leon Panetta, uh, making, uh, issuing a warning based on what anybody who works in this field know is reality. And uh, Madam President, if you think about it, uh, in, in recent weeks we've watched again one section of our country, in this case the Northeast, including my own state of Connecticut, uh, hit by Hurricane Sandy, uh, and then a follow-on Northeaster storm, um, losing power in some sections, New York, parts of New York, certainly New Jersey, hit harder than Connecticut, but we were hit pretty hard ourselves. But losing power, some still are without power, and this is the third week uh, since the uh, hurricane. And uh, this is exactly the kind of dislocation and suffering that would occur if an enemy um, cyber attacked America's electric power system. And uh, it's, it's why we need to at least vote to take this bill up now with a sense of urgency in this session. Time's not on our side. We have to act. Uh, Madam President, the elections are over. The American people, through their votes, have told us in a clear and certain voice that they want us to work together to solve the many challenges our nation confronts. I, I know we're focused on avoiding going over the fiscal cliff. And this is another classic where the challenge to Congress is can we, uh, can we solve our fiscal problems? Can we come to a bipartisan compromise before we go over the cliff? In, in this case uh, of cyber security and cyber vulnerability, the challenge before us is can we come to a bipartisan agreement, compromise, and we think we have uh, in the bill be, uh, before us, and, and create and improve our defenses um, before a catastrophic cyber attack occurs, as it surely will, uh, and, uh, and then we come rushing back uh, to raise our defenses, as we did after 9-11, after we've suffered an attack. Mr. President, would the Senator yield for a I question? Will. I will. Thank you. I just wanted to ask the distinguished chairman who just referenced the important word here, compromise. Uh, if he's spoken about the extent to which this bill reflects not only the original compromise, the bipartisan compromise between himself and his ranking man member, Senator Susan Collins of Maine, but then a second compromise done to reach further to our Republican colleagues that is actually already embedded in this bill. And I think it's important for the people who are watching and listening to us to recognize that not only was this an original bipartisan bill that was the product of compromise discussion and negotiation, but then a further unilateral step was taken by the distinguished chairman to move even more towards Republican colleagues. And so it's really not only compromise, but double compromise that is on the floor right now. Uh, I thank my <coughs> friend from Rhode Island. I thank my friend for his, um, his interest in the area of cybersecurity and for his leadership. Um, I haven't talked about that yet, and, and I will right now, <laughs> which is to say, um, following the advice of most of the experts, both political administrations, last two administrations, experts outside, our original, the centerpiece, one of the centerpieces of our original bill was to create a public-private process, government and, and people who live in these sectors of our economy, to draft best practices, not to have them imposed by the government, and then to make it mandatory within a set period of time that, uh, and these practices, these standards would be general principles, not all do's and don'ts, uh, to leave room for uh, the private sector to come up with the best way they thought they could meet those standards. Now, opponents, particularly in the business community, some of our friends uh, on the other side have, have uh, said to us that they feared that that would be more regulation of business um, Senator Collins, my ranking 
member, dear friend, is, is a leading advocate of regulation reform. But she said, um, and, and lighter regulation on business, she said so over and over again with such credibility and force, this is not regulation of business, this is protection of our homeland security, of our economy. Uh, you, you, you will uh, reform regulations when the regulations seem to be too much and get in the way of economic growth. We have a threat here that is today stealing billions of dollars of American innovation, taking jobs uh, elsewhere in the world. So, okay, we, we had it mandatory, but it was clear that uh, we, we were not going to get to 60 votes. And, you know, I, I've said over and over again here that one of the problems we have in this in Congress now is that people seem to say if they don't get 100 percent of what they want, uh, they're not going to vote for a bill. So I had to listen to my own words here. <laughs> And because if you wait for 100 percent of what you want on a bill, everybody's going to end up with zero percent. You might as well try to uh, get done what you agree on. And so we took a big step, which was to make those mandatory standards voluntary. And then we threw in an incentive, which is uh, a li partial liability, immunity from liability in the case of a cyber attack as an encouragement for those companies who voluntarily opt into the standards that uh, the voluntary process would set up, they get some immunity from liability for prosecution. Incidentally, uh, President Obama has made very clear, first, that he, he totally gets the seriousness of this challenge to our security, cyber challenge to our security and our prosperity. And uh, he has supported this legislation, but he has gone one step further now and said, if we fail to pass legislation, he will issue an executive order that does as much as an executive order can do to protect America better from cyber attack and cyber theft. The president does have the authority to issue an executive order that will establish standards for cybersecurity for all 18 critical infrastructure sectors under existing law and require those sectors to be implemented in certain areas where the regulators have the power to uh, mandate such, uh, such uh, 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 observance of the standards. A draft of such uh, a presidential order is now being uh, circulated, but the president doesn't have the power under existing law to to offer a lot of the benefits that our bill would give private sector owners of critical infrastructure. For one thing, the President doesn't uh, have the ability to offer the private sector uh, owners the liability protection uh, I've just described. In addition, needed changes to law that permit private companies to share cybersecurity threat information among themselves and with the government will go uh, unmade. So both sides in this debate have acknowledged that this is a critical piece of any bill, but it can't be implemented by executive action. Uh, we're the lawmakers. We have the, the ability to protect our country better than the president does by executive order. But I, I have appealed to the president that if we're not able to act here, that he should issue this executive order. I'm very encouraged. Uh, by the work done on it, and I'm confident that if we fail to act, the president will act. I think he has a responsibility to act because if we fail to act, we're leaving the American people extremely, extremely vulnerable to a major uh, cyber attack, and therefore the legislation is preferable. An executive order uh, will certainly give the American people more uh, protection. Um, I have more I could say, but I note the presence on the floor of my colleague and, and partner in this uh, pursuit, uh, the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator Feinstein. If you would like to speak, I would yield the floor to you. I would, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President, uh, Madam President, if I may, um, Senator Lieberman, I really want to compliment you on your work, your steadfast determination to get this bill passed. Uh, I think you and your ranking member, Senator Collins, uh, have really done a very fine job. And I hope to talk about those hours when we sat down with other members uh, trying to negotiate something uh, that people might agree to. Um, I, 
am very worried. I am very worried that there will be a major attack on this nation. And I don't really say that without intelligence uh, to back us up. We receive regular warnings that the intelligence community provides to us that attacks are increasing in number, sophistication, and damage. Unfortunately, despite significant changes made to the Cybersecurity Act that Senator Lieberman, uh, Senator Collins, Senator Rockefeller agreed to, many on the other side of the aisle filibustered the bill. And since that time, we have learned of additional major cyber attacks. In October and September of this year, at least nine major United States banks were hit by a series of attacks that blocked their customers from accessing their banking information or making online transactions. This list of victims includes the country's largest, most sophisticated financial institutions. The Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Chase, Citigroup, the United States Bank, Wells Fargo, PNC, Capital One, BB&T Corporation, and HSBC, all cyber attacked. Now, these attacks systematically hit banks for five weeks. They disrupted traffic at each bank for a day or two before moving on to the next victim. It was a well-planned and coordinated cyber attack from bank to bank to bank to bank. It disrupted the banking system, but it didn't destroy it. But that doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to destroy it. This is a real wake-up call, and I think we ignore it at our own peril. And I really have come to believe that it is negligent to fail to pass a bill. I remember I was on the Intelligence Committee when the director, then Director Tenet, came before the committee in the middle of the year sometime and said to us, we anticipate an attack. We don't know where, we don't know when. And that attack came, and it was 9-11. Today, there is the same anticipation of a big attack. And we need to put in place the legal procedures to prevent that. Let me go on. In August, a foreign country or organization used computer code to destroy 30,000 computers at the world's largest energy company. That's Saudi Aramco, and that's Saudi Arabia's state-owned oil company. So how was this done? Now, according to the New York Times, the cyber attackers unleashed a computer virus to initiate what's regarded as among the most destructive acts of computer sabotage on a company to date. The virus erased data on three quarters of Aramco's corporate PCs, documents, spreadsheets, emails, files, replacing all of it with an image of a burning American flag. Now, if anything is a harbinger of things to come, that is clear. Why would you put on a major cyber attack burning American flags unless you had some additional intent? We cannot underestimate the threat, and to do so is sheer negligence on the part of this body. In the five months from October 11 through February 2012, over 50,000 cyber attacks were reported on private and government networks, with 86 of those attacks taking place on critical infrastructure networks. So we've had 86 attacks on critical infrastructure networks. Keep in mind that these 50,000 incidents were only the ones reported to the Department of Homeland Security. So they represent but a small fraction of cyber attacks carried out against the United States. This year, 2012, Nissan, 
MasterCard, and Visa joined the ranks of major companies to be hacked. Joining Sony, Citi, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Google, Booz, Amel, ha Booz Allen Hamilton, Visa, RSA, L3, and the Chamber of Commerce as victims of hacking last year. We also know that last year, for at least six months, 48 companies in the chemical, defense, and other industries were penetrated by a hacker looking to steal intellectual property. The cybersecurity company, Symantec, has attributed these attacks to cute computers in Hebei, China. Here's the point. We know we are being attacked by other countries. I hear it in intelligence. It is classified, so I can't go into it here. But suffice it to say that we know it is happening. Things are only going to get worse. Secretary Panetta testified to this. And let me just read one section of his testimony. The collective result of these kinds of attacks could be a cyber Pearl Harbor, an attack that would cause physical destruction and loss of life. In fact, it would paralyze and shock the nation and create a new profound sense of vulnerability. Members of the Senate, we are warned. We are warned clearly, we are warned directly, and we are warned by the Cyber Commander, General Alexander, as well as the Secretary of Defense. And yet, we do nothing. I strongly believe we should pass this bill. It's a step along the way. Clearly, it will go to the House. Clearly, there will be a conference. In order to get something, there will be some accommodations made. There is no reason for this Senate, knowing what we know, not to pass this bill. We also know the, the President would sign a bill like this. And we know the President would not sign the House bill as is. So we have an opportunity to make the changes. I want to remind my colleagues of efforts made to negotiate an agreement on this bill. Before the bill came to the floor in July, and while the Senate was considering it, there were numerous meetings every day by a dozen or more senators. The authors of the bill met with Senators McCain, Chambliss, Hutchison, the sponsors of the Secure IT Act, as well as with Senators Kyle and White House and a group they convened. We had multiple meetings with the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber's largest concern was over the liability protections in our information sharing language, which is what I had something to do with and the intelligence staff worked on and prepared. I asked where they thought our language was deficient. I asked them if they could improve on the immunity provisions, please send us bill language. Did they? No, they did not. I think that is some testimony that's worth thinking about it. The majority leader offered to vote on a set list of amendments. He asked if the minority would put together the 10 votes it wanted, as long as they were relevant and germane to the bill, and we'd go through them. No list was provided. And so we voted by a vote of 52 to 46, and cloture was not invoked. Again, after the vote, the staff from both sides of the Homeland Security Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Intelligence Committee held numerous meetings to negotiate a compromise. The effort did not succeed. So if we're to address the major problem of cyber attacks and potential cyber warfare, we have no option but to bring the Lieberman-Collins bill back on the floor. <sighs> Mr. President, I know my time is limited. I know the nation's cyber laws are woefully out of date. I want to also just touch on one thing. I received a call on the information sharing part of this bill about the Homeland Security po a portal 
works change. And that CEO said, we would like our information to go directly in to the various defense companies. That creates a big problem. It created a problem with a number of United States senators who are concerned about the military getting private information. It uh, created a big concern with the um, privacy organizations throughout our country. And so it was changed that the portal be run, most likely, by Homeland Security. But here's the point I want to make. The transfer of information is with the click of a mouse. It moves instantaneously. So that as information... Your time has expired. Uh, may I ask unanimous consent to have one minute to conclude? Is there objection? So Without objection. As, thank you very much. So as information comes in, it goes instantaneously into the correct area. The CEO said, I didn't know that. Thank you. I have no problem with that. So I would ask, you see, I really think disagreeing with some aspects of this bill isn't that important. We're never going to do the perfect bill without experience. The bills are going to have to be changed and amended as time goes on. But I think passing a bill is important. I think to leave this country vulnerable, not to pass a bill because somebody doesn't like this or that, is negligent, it is irresponsible, and God forbid if we have that major Pearl Harbor that Secretary Panetta referred to. So I urge my colleagues to pass this bill. I thank the chair for the extra time. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The senator from Georgia. Uh, senator Grassley, who is next, has been kind to give me about 30 to 45 seconds, uh, so I appreciate that. Um, uh, Mr. President, July and August, when the co-sponsors of both the Underlying bill, the Lieberman Collins bill, and the Secure IT bill, which I am a co sponsor of, met regularly. And I was hopeful that we could resolve the significant differences between these two bills. Unfortunately, we did not reach an agreement, and even though we had been promised an open amendment process on this underlying bill, the majority leader has once again filled the tree and filed for cloture. I voted against cloture in August, and unfortunately, nothing has changed since then. So I'm compelled to do the same thing today. We all understand the serious threat that is facing our country from cyber attacks and intrusions, but that does not mean that Congress should just pass any bill. Frankly, the, uh, the underlying bill is not supported by the business community for all the right reasons, and they're the ones that are impacted by it. They're the ones that are going to be called to uh, uh, comply with the mandates and the regulations, and uh, frankly, it is just not going to give them the kind of protection that they need from cyber attacks. So I regret to stand up today and say that I intend to vote against uh, cloture on this bill. And I yield to Senator Gr President. Senator from Iowa. Yeah. Um, we're again discussing this very important topic of cybersecurity. Uh, it's a topic that we all agree is of utmost importance and worthy of our attention. Unfortunately, this is a little bit like the movie Groundhog's Day. Uh, the majority continues to push the same flawed legislation that failed to garner enough votes for consideration just three months ago. No one disputes the need for Congress to work on the issue of cybersecurity. However, members do disagree with the notion this problem requires legislation that increases the size of the federal government bureaucracy and at the same time places new burdens and regulations on business. Enhancing cybersecurity is important to our national security. I support efforts to strengthen our nation against cyber attacks. However, I take issue with those who have come to the floor and argued that those who don't support this bill are against strengthening our nation's cybersecurity. As I said in August, disagreements over how to address policy matters shouldn't devolve into accusations 
about a member's willingness to tackle this tough issue. The debate over cybersecurity legislation has turned from a substantive analysis of the merits into a political blame game as to which side supports defending our nation the more. If we want to tackle big issues like cybersecurity, we need to rise above disagreements and work on a constructive matter. Disagreements over policy should be openly and freely debated. Unfortunately, this isn't how the debate on cybersecurity proceeded. Instead, before a real debate began last August, the majority cut it off. This was contrary to the majority's promise earlier this year of an open amendment process to address cybersecurity. Aside from process, I also have significant substantive concerns about the bill. Chief among my concerns with this pending bill is the role played by the Department of Homeland Security. These concerns stem from oversight that I've conducted on the implementation of a program called Chemical Facilities Anti-Terrorism Standards. We call that acronym CFATS for short. CFATS was the department's first major foray into regulation of the chemical sector. Homeland Security spent nearly a half a billion dollars on the program. Five years later, they've just begun to approve site security plans for more than 4,000 facilities designated under the rule. I've continued to conduct oversight on this matter, despite assurances from Homeland Security that they fix all the problems with CFATS, I keep discovering yet more problems. On top of this concern, since the last vote in August, the chairman and ranking member of the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations have released a report criticizing Homeland Security and the fusion centers that they operate. The subcommittee report criticized Homeland Security's fusion center as pool, a quote, pools of ineptitude, waste, and civil liberties intrusion, end of quote. And that's the evaluation after Homeland Security spent as much as one and four tenths billion dollars on the program. Given these examples, I'm baffled why the Senate would take an agency that has proven problems with overseeing critical infrastructure and give them chief responsibility for our country's cybersecurity. Additionally, I'm concerned with the provisions that restrict the way information is shared. The restrictions imposed under Title VII of the bill are a step backward from other information sharing proposals. This includes the bill that I've co-sponsored, the Secure-It bill. The bill before us places Homeland Security in the role of gatekeeper of cyber threat information. The bill calls for Homeland Security to share the information in, quote, as close to real time as possible, end of quote, with other agencies. However, this will create a bottleneck for information coming into the government. Further, Title VII includes restrictions on what types of information can be shared, limiting the use of it for criminal prosecutions except those that cause imminent harm. This is exactly the type of restriction on information sharing that the 9-11 Commission warned us about now 10 years ago. The fact, in fact, the 9-11 Commission said, quote, the wall resulted in far less information sharing and coordination, end of quote. The Commission further added, quote, the removal of the wall that existed before 9-11 between intelligence and law enforcement has opened up new opportunities for cooperative action, end of quote. Why should we even consider legislation that could rebuild these walls that threaten our national security? We haven't had any real debate on these issues. The lack of process, real process, in the Senate on this current bill amplifies my substantive concern. In fact, this is eerily reminiscent of the debates surrounding Obamacare. 
Here we are once again in a lame duck session the week before Thanksgiving tackling a serious problem that hasn't been given the benefit of the Senate's full process here on the floor of this body. I don't want cybersecurity legislation to become another Obamacare. If we're serious about our nation's security, then shouldn't we treat it as the serious matter we say it is? Additionally, the staff of the sponsors of the legislation before us continue behind the scenes effort to negotiate changes to the bill that we're asked to vote on. If the bill sponsors are still negotiating changes, why don't we have the benefit of the full and open amendment process to try and fix it before we vote for cloture? It simply doesn't make sense. Instead, it appears today's vote is about something other than cybersecurity. It's yet another attempt by the majority to paint the minority as obstructing the work of the United States Senate. Most likely, this vote will be used simply as fuel for the majority's effort to dismantle uh, unlimited debate in the United States Senate. So much for tackling cybersecurity without putting politics into the mix. This isn't the way that we're supposed to legislate. The people who elect us expect much more. How many senators are prepared to vote on something this important without knowing its impact because we haven't followed regular order? Are we to once again pass a bill so that the American public can then read it and find out what's in it. These are questions that all senators should consider, and our citizens should know in advance what we're actually considering. If we're serious about addressing this problem, then let's deal with it appropriately. Rushing something through that will impact the country in such a massive way isn't the way that we should do business. It's not good for the country, and it's not good for this body. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Texas. How much time is remaining on our side? 20 minutes. Thank you. And are there other, are there other speakers on our side? Well, let me just say uh, to notify me when there are 10 minutes left in case uh, Senator Collins comes or someone else. Okay. So I would like to have up to 10 minutes and be notified. Mr. President, um, I rise to uh, speak against revoting this cloture. And the main reason is that we are not going to be allowed to have amendments. Uh, that is unacceptable because though we have worked diligently with the sponsors of the cybersecurity bill on the floor, um, a number of the ranking members of the relevant committees that have jurisdiction over cyber security have an alternative bill, the Secure IT Act, that uh, we would like to be able to put forward as an alternative or have an amendment process that would allow um, our approach to um, have a chance to prevail anyway. Now, we're aware that the President is um, signaling his intention to um, issue an executive order. Uh, but an executive order is not sufficient to really give the encouragement and the protection to the companies in the reporting lines to allow them to share information with other uh, companies that m might have the same type of threats in the same industry area uh, or with the federal government. And I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to have amendments that would allow us to perfect this bill. Let me say that it, the proponents of Senate Bill 3414 acknowledge that it is important to have a collaborative effort between the businesses that run almost 90 percent of our nation's networks and the federal government. And we agree with that, which is why we have worked with the private networks and the companies that run them uh, to fashion a bill that would give them immunity uh, if they share information and to give them the direct reporting capabilities to go directly to the defense agencies. Uh, because we believe that the agencies that regulate the communications and the uh, military uh, industrial base um, uh, programs would have more of an understanding of the needs 
and what can be done to launch a counterattack in a direct way. The bill that is on the floor, however, requires everything to go through the Homeland Security Department. Um, and those of us who are su supporting secure IT believe that it should be a direct reporting requirement uh, to the agency of regulation or to the defense agencies. The sponsors of our bill are the uh, ranking members of eight subcommittees and committees that have jurisdiction in this area. Senators McCain, Chambliss, Grassley, Murkowski, Coates, Burr, Johnson, and myself. And we believe that the consensus items in our bill are preferable to the bill that is before us that we are not going to be allowed to amend. The Secure IT offers the balanced approach that will significantly advance cybersecurity in both the public and private sectors. First, to facilitate sharing of cyber threat information between the private sector and government, allow the reporting to go to the defense agencies where the response can be direct, not filtered through Homeland Security. Secondly, it gives liability immunity for sharing among the industries that might be affected as well as the defensive actions that are taken. This is essential because uh, you even need antitrust uh, immunity if you are going to share vital information on this issue so that you're not going to get sued for collaborating with a competitor. And it is in our country's interest, and I think our, our private sector companies want the ability to help secure all of our networks because we know that this is a real threat. Secure IT has the overwhelming support of the network operators that are trying to gear up to defend against cyber threats. Because it will help their members protect their networks, we have the endorsement of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and I would ask unanimous consent to submit the letter from the Chamber of Commerce dated November 14th of this year, for the With, record. Without objection. And the National Association of Manufacturers, the American Fuel and Petroleum Manufacturers, the American Petroleum Institute, U.S. Telecom, National Retail Federation, Financial Services Roundtable, Internet Security Alliance, and the CTIA, the Wireless Association. We can come together to pass the areas of secure IT that would allow better cooperation and also a, uh, a reporting relationship that they understand and know they will be able to defend uh, against the cyber attacks with. We believe it is a superior bill and would like the ability to amend the bill on the floor uh, to perfect it so that we could send a bill um, to the House. If we are not able to get this bill this year, Certainly, I hope it will be started again with all of the relevant committees doing the markups, doing the discussion that is required for a bill of this magnitude. Uh, many of the committees did not have markups. They did not have input into the bill until it was introduced. Uh, the committee process does work when we're able to use it. And I hope that we will be able to go back to the drawing boards or if the uh, majority would allow amendments down the road if we have the time later this year. We would love to continue working with the sponsors of the legislation uh, to see if we could uh, come up with the amendments to which everyone could agree. It's been a tough road. We've all tried hard. I think the sponsors of the bill are sincere in wanting to improve the systems. Uh, the ranking members uh, that have co-sponsored the Secure IT, who also have jurisdiction uh, of this area, also are sincere. And I hope that we can come together, um, hopefully later this year, but if not, certainly um, in the new year with the new session. Let's start from the beginning and go through all the committees of jurisdiction so that there can be a real consensus and a give and take. So, Mr. President, I thank you and I yield the floor. President. From Connecticut. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to speak for up to one minute and not have the time taken out of the uh, Republican side.
Is there objection? Without objection. Mr. President, I want to respond uh, to the concern of my friend from Texas that if uh, cloture is granted on this motion uh, to proceed, that there will not be an opportunity to amend the bill. I understand why she's saying that, but I do want to say that uh, Senator Reid has made clear, I think twice today, that if cloture is granted, uh, he is open to, he will uh, allow amendments. He, he said that he can't allow endless amendments because we're in a lame duck session with a limited time, but that uh, he, he's, he will allow a finite number of amendments, if you will, on both sides. So I want to assure my colleagues that, uh, and appeal to my colleagues to vote to at least take this measure up. I mean, the cyber enemies are at the gates. In fact, they've, they've already broken through the gates. And the least we can do is debate and vote on amendments uh, to determine how we can strengthen our cyber defenses. I, th I thank my colleagues and I yield the floor. The Senator from Maine. Mr. President, first let me thank the Senator from Texas for reserving some time for me while I was uh, at a briefing and on my way to the floor. I will attempt to be very quick because I know our colleagues are eager to vote on this important issue. And Mr. President, that is my point. This is a critically important issue. How many more warnings do we need to hear from the experts that we are extremely vulnerable to a cybersecurity attack? Cyber attacks are happening every day. Just recently, there was an attack on several of our financial institutions. According to press reports, it was launched by Iranian sources. We know that Iran, Russia, and China are extremely active in probing our cyber systems including those that control our critical infrastructure, not only our financial systems, our transportation systems, our water treatment plants, but also our electric grid. Recently, we have seen what Hurricane Sandy, the superstorm, has done to states, so many states, destroying lives and property and leaving people without power for days on end. Well, multiply that many times, Mr. President, if it were a deliberate cyber attack that knocked out the electric grid along the entire East Coast. That's what we're talking about. That is the kind of risk that calls us to act. We have heard from the experts over and over again that this vulnerability is huge and escalating. We know that the number of cyber attacks that have been reported to the Department of Homeland Security has increased by 200% in just the last year. And those are just the, the attacks that have been reported. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Undoubtedly, there are many more on our critical infrastructure that have not been reported. We know that there have been attempts to probe the security of the computer systems that run some of our natural gas pipelines. This problem is very real, and it is not only a threat to our national and homeland security, it is also a threat to the economic prosperity of this country. How many more thefts of research and development of intellectual property, of businesses right here in our country that are providing good jobs for Americans do we need to endure before we act to secure our cyber systems. Mr. President, I have worked on the cyber security bill for years with my friend, colleague, and chairman, Joe Lieberman. We have held countless hearings 
We have marked up a previous bill. It's so ironic that we're being criticized for not doing yet another markup on this bill when all of the changes reflect our attempts to address the criticisms of the opponents of this bill. We made a huge change by making this bill voluntary rather than mandatory and by providing incentives such as liability protections for businesses that voluntarily agree to adopt cyber standards. We've created a system where there would be a cooperative process between the public and the private sector to share information and to develop the best practices so that that information can be shared. In all the time that I have worked on homeland security issues, I cannot think of another threat where our vulnerability is greater and where we have failed to act and have done less. Mr. President, this isn't a Republican or a Democratic or an independent issue. The experts, regardless of their political leanings from the Bush administration to the current administration, have urged us to act, have pleaded with us to act. General Alexander, the nonpartisan general who, who is the head of Cyber Command and the head of the National Security Agency, has urged this Congress over and over again to give this administration, to give our country the tools that it needs to protect critical infrastructure and to help safeguard our economic edge. Mr. President, I urge our colleagues to listen to the wisdom of former Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff and former NSA Chief General Michael Hayden. From the previous administration, from President Bush's administration, they wrote the following. We carry the burden of knowing that 9-11 might have been averted with the intelligence that existed at the time. We do not want to be in the same position again when a cyber 9-11 hits. It is not a question of whether this will happen. It is a question of when." End quote. Mr. President, this time all the dots have been connected. This time we know that cyber attacks are occurring each and every day. This time, the warnings are loud and clear. How can we ignore these dire warnings? How, how can we fail to act on the cybersecurity bill, especially since the majority leader has indicated that he is willing to allow for amendments, as he should, to make this process fair. Germane amendments would be allowed. So I urge our colleagues to heed the warnings from the experts and to vote for cloture on the cybersecurity bill so that we can proceed to its consideration. I don't want to be here a year from now saying, why didn't we act? Why didn't we listen to the cyber experts from the Bush administration, from the Obama administration, from General Keith Alexander, the premier expert in our government? Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Senator from Delaware. Excuse me, unanimous consent to speak for one more minute if we have, uh, if, if I could. Is there objection? 
without objection. This is the, uh, the first uh, opportunity we will have had since uh, returning from the elections to cast a vote on a meaningful piece of legislation. Uh, and as uh, legislation goes, it's about as meaningful as, as any we're going to come across uh, for a while. If we were in the minority and the Republicans were coming to the floor and asking us to, uh, to support uh, moving to a bill so that we could offer, so we could debate it, uh, offer amendments to the bill, uh, I would hope that we would do that. For our Republican friends who are fearful that they're not going to have a chance to offer those amendments, uh, Senator Lieberman, the chairman of the committee, a ranking Republican, uh, uh, Susan Collins, myself, all co-sponsors of the bill, uh, we will work very hard to make sure that any amendments that are relevant and germane to the bill can be offered, can be debated. Uh, we, uh, we worked a similar process with the, uh, the postal bill. We ended up having 50 or 60 amendments. They weren't all relevant or germane, but in the end we had a lot of amendments and a chance for everybody to be heard and to offer their amendments. Now, some of those amendments were not relevant or germane. As long as amendments are relevant and germane to this underlying legislation on cybersecurity, we will work very hard to make sure folks have their opportunity to be heard and to vote on, on, their, uh, on their proposal. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Senator from Maine. Ms. 